Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, dear experts, dear speakers and dear participants, it is uh, my pleasure to start our international event dedicated uh, to uh, Crimea and we have uh, excellent speakers today from Estonia and uh, Ukraine and we decided uh, to continue our series of events focused on uh, various issues related uh, to uh, Ukraine and its uh, international agenda. And of course, today's event is uh, dedicated to the situation uh, in uh, illegally occupied Crimea. Of course, we mark a very sad event of uh, seven years of that illegal occupation and uh, we think that it is a very important duty of international community and friends of Ukraine and partners to uh, remind that uh, event to the global community of democratic world and of course uh, uh, to note that seven years ago a major shift happened uh, in uh, geopolitics, not just in uh, geopolitics in the Black Sea region, but also uh, it has had consequences to the uh, security of uh, Europe as a whole. Uh, moreover, of course, uh, that illegal occupation uh, would project also substantial consequences uh, for uh, Crimea itself, itself and also for uh, Ukrainian uh, society. So today we would like to address uh, different issues uh, related uh, to this illegal occupation uh, like uh, militarization of the peninsula, also maybe uh, to touch upon uh, uh, some alarming uh, problems with uh, ecology but uh, of course, uh, not to mention uh, the violation of uh, human rights and uh, okay, also some uh, uh, media uh, and disinformation related uh, issues. So seven years is already a long period and obviously uh, it will have uh, very big consequences uh, in terms of the next generations of those who live now under the uh, Russian occupation uh, in uh, Crimea, but also on uh, the Ukrainian society as a whole. Well, that is uh, the reason why we would like to keep these uh, uh, issues uh, on the uh, international agenda. And today's event is uh, organized in a very close cooperation uh, with the uh, Ukrainian Embassy in Tallinn and of course I'm very grateful uh, to uh, the colleagues uh, in the Embassy and personally to the uh, Ambassador Mariana Betza for uh, co-hosting and co-organizing this uh, event and without further ado I would like to uh, give the floor to the Ambassador for her uh, remarks on the issue. Ambassador, please. Excuse me, do you see me or not? Do you see me or hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, um, I, I experienced some technical difficulties. Uh, do you see me? Let us... Uh... Yes, Ambassador, we can see you. Perfect. I'm sorry. So there are some, I, I have some technical issues. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dmitrom. Thank you to all organizers and um, to all the excellent speakers. Indeed, uh, we mark the seventh uh, anniversary, sad anniversary of illegal occupation and um, attempted annexation by the Russian Federation of uh, Crimean Peninsula. I can't imagine personal that it's been seven years that Ukraine has been living under the Russian aggression and uh, it, it, is, it continues, uh, but it is the sad reality. And, of course, the uh, Russian Federation committed a grave crime, crime against uh, peace, crime against humanity. Uh, it violated gravely uh, the UN Charter and uh, international law by uh, 
attempted annexation of uh, the Crimean Peninsula, which is an integral part of Ukraine. Russians' uh, land grab in Crimea in 2014 um, caused a real major challenge, and uh, um, not only challenge, but also a crisis, a big crisis in international relations. It also totally reshaped the whole system of international architecture and the rule-based world order. Um, indeed, the tendencies for the past seven years are only deteriorating, and to name a few, uh, I would say first, um, we can witness military buildup in the Crimean Peninsula and projection of force beyond the Azov Black uh, Sea region. For example, in, since 2014, Russian forces more than doubled up to 32,000 servicemen. Russian Black Sea Fleet has grown to 67 warships and seven submarines. Second, military exercises disrupt maritime navigation and in danger environment. Vessels going from the Black Sea to Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov are delayed by Russia for, for an average for 17 hours. Third, forced conscription of Ukrainian citizens in Crimea to serve in, in the Russian military. Fourth, by the end of 2020, the Ukrainian human rights defended, defenders um, stressed that the human rights situation in the occupied Crimea is indeed alarming. We could also witness it uh, by distance monitoring group within UN uh, organization, uh, United Nations organization, namely political persecution. We have roughly 100 political prisoners in the occupied Crimea, which are illegally detained by the occupying forces on the trumped up charges. 100 political citizens, political prisoners, whom we know, but of course there, are, there is information that are much more, the figure is much more. The oppression of ethnic minorities and indigenous people, racial discrimination. For example, the majlis of the Crimean Tatar people remains banned, and education in the Ukrainian language is available only in 0.2 percentage of schools. Suppression of religious freedoms, curtailment of freedom of expression and freedom of the media. We do not have independent journalists there. And those who are still there, they are either illegally detained and are political prisoners, or they're persecuted, or, or they had to flee the Crimean Peninsula. Tortures, summary executions, enforced disappearances. This is a day reality in the occupied Crimea for the seventh year in a row. And of course, there are numerous attempts by the Russian Federation to incorporate, legally incorporate Crimea into its legal framework, political framework, military framework, economic fr fr framework, to sort of legalize its crime, if I may say so. Definitely the reaction of the world and of the entire international community has been strong so far. First, the policy of non-recognition. Definitely for seven years in a row, all of our partners, the EU, US, like-minded partners, they do not recognize illegal occupation and attempted annexation by the Russian Federation of Crimea. Secondly, the sanctions, individual and sectoral sanctions. We deem that it is a really powerful instrument indeed, and we're grateful to all our partners who for so many years have managed to maintain this sanction mechanism on uh, the Russian Federation. We deem that they are really working, out, working, but definitely we need to strengthen them at the individual level and also at the level of uh, international organizations as well. Uh, and the third, this is the information and uh, political platform that Ukraine has established, the Crimean platform. It's a new mechanism which we deem it necessary to provide necessary approaches for deoccupying Crimea in the future. This is a platform which has a political dimension, a parliamentary dimension and a dimension of experts. And we have launched, the President of Ukraine, along with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, have launched this platform. And the inaugural summit of this platform is supposed to take place on August 23rd in Ukraine, where we hope that the heads of states and the heads of governments will be able to attend. Obviously, this is not the summit for the sake of the summit. Uh, this is the platform which we would like to use and as a very powerful information and political platform 
for uh, synergy of all our efforts, for consolidation of non-recognition policy, for, um, issue, for issues like security, including freedom of navigation in the Black Sea, effectiveness of sanctions against the aggressor state and their extension, protection of human rights, including freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, educational, cultural, and religious rights. And of course, overcoming the negative impact of the te temporary occupation of Crimea on the economy and environment. Obviously, the ultimate goal, goal of the Crimean platform is the decupation of Crimea, its return to Ukraine, and Russia should bear full responsibility for its illegal actions, for its crimes, and uh, also pay compensation to Ukraine for illegal occupation. In a broader sense, the uh, goal of the platform's activity is to restore uh, respect for norms and principles of international law, to reinstate the rule-based uh, order, and to ensure absolutely resolute and rejection of any attempt to change internationally recognized borders by the use of force, uh, as it is provided by international law, namely by the Helsinki Final Act. We consider that these three instruments, uh, the policy of non-recognition, which should be maintained by all states, second, the strengthening and uh, the um, deepening maybe of sanction mechanisms uh, on the aggressor state is necessary. And third, now we have the platform for considering the issues which are related to Crimea and its decupation. And this is the Crimean platform which has been launched recently. And we consider that it will be the relevant uh, platform to discuss and to find proper mechanisms, legal. our control over the occupied Crimea. And taking this opportunity, I would like to thank all our partners, in particular Estonia, where I am based, for its absolutely resolute position uh, of non-recognition of illegal occupation of Crimea, for its absolutely strong stance and unwavering support of Ukraine throughout the seven years. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward for our discussion. And thank you to Dmitro Tiperik and ICDS for organizing along with us this important event. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much uh, for kind words. And uh, now I think it's a good opportunity to hear uh, the uh, Estonian position, which is, of course, uh, very uh, firm and friendly to Ukraine as our uh, international partner. Uh, Mr. Marco Mikkelsen, who is uh, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee at the Estonian Parliament, uh, Marco, uh, I know that uh, uh, occupation of Crimea is a very uh, challenging uh, topic in international relations. So what is your assessment? Uh, uh, which instrument could or should uh, our country, Estonia, as a member of the European Union, member of NATO, uh, and uh, also through other international fora, uh, what instruments could we use in order to uh, forward this topic of uh, Crimean uh, deoccupation. Marco. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dmitry and uh, uh, Ambassador. Uh, good to see you and uh, your uh, remarks were very important, of course, to uh, recognize very close cooperation of Estonia and Ukraine on, uh, on, um, on these uh, issues as we talk today about this uh, Crimea. Uh, annexation of Crimea and occupation of Crimea. But uh, let me first, um, answering Mitra to your question, say uh, firmly that Estonia does not and will never, uh, of course, recognize Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. And uh, perhaps uh, when we talk today uh, uh, about uh, and focusing on, on Crimea, we should understand that uh, this is this this is not only about uh, Crimea. This is about uh, Ukraine. This is about uh, freedom in uh, in Europe and uh, and uh, freedom of uh, of of us all who uh, uh, share democratic uh, values and principles of international law. Because what has happened uh, since 2014, since February 2014? 
and unfortunately, which ongoing uh, till now is Russia's efforts to destroy Ukrainian statehood. This is not only about uh, to destroy territorial integrity of uh, of Ukraine, but also uh, to uh, uh, destroy sovereignty and uh, statehood of statehood of uh, Ukraine. And we, of course, here in Estonia has followed very closely all these seven years uh, uh, what has happened around uh, Crimea, has happened in eastern Ukraine, uh, and have given all our support, uh, full-hearted support to, to friends in, in Kiev in order to stand against uh, this uh, ongoing aggression. Uh, and uh, saying this, uh, you could see one way that uh, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, Crimea still is occupied. Uh, Crimea is annexed illegally uh, by Russia. And unfortunately, all these atrocities, what the uh, ambassador described to us as well, are ongoing uh, the violation of elementary uh, principles of uh, human rights uh, and international law. Basically, we see them happening every day. Uh, and uh, this is something where not only us who closely monitor the situation in, uh, in, in, in and around Crimea, but the international community must be very, very concerned. And uh, this is why perhaps the first level I, I could bring in into the sort of topics where we can talk about uh, the specific uh, concrete actions. The Estonia is um, currently a non-permanent member of, uh, of uh, Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, just recently, uh, last month, we had uh, uh, another discussion about uh, the, the situation in, uh, in Crimea and uh, in U Ukraine in general. And uh, our diplomatic efforts uh, 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 at that level in Security Council are uh, all focused to, to maintain uh, the sort of attention of international community to, uh, to the situation uh, in and around uh, uh, Crimea or uh, related to aggression of Russia against uh, Ukraine. Uh, then we talk about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the relevant actions which can uh, really matter and uh, in, in the future change uh, the situation uh, on the ground is of course ongoing pressure, ongoing, uh, uh, ongoingly dealing with the issues in the international, on international level, international forums like uh, uh, Council of Europe, uh, of course, uh, uh, European Union level, but also uh, NATO is very relevant uh, uh, organization to the point that uh, Ambassador mentioned about uh, uh, militarization of, uh, of Crimea and, uh, and the entire uh, Black Sea uh, region. So we, we see multidimensional sort of uh, approach needed here. Uh, obviously, uh, we very much support the idea that uh, uh, among uh, efforts should be uh, uh, maintaining, minimum maintaining, of course, sanction mechanism, uh, which has been quite a miracle in many ways to, to keep it uh, among uh, 27 member states of European Union. But it, that shows how important the issue is, and uh, I have not seen any uh, real threat uh, to this unity. Uh, just the question is how to make, we can strengthen uh, perhaps uh, the uh, sanctions, which which really could uh, could uh, uh, make an impact uh, in the future on uh, assertive uh, aggressive uh, policies of. Uh, Russian Federation. We have uh, next month, uh, actually this month, at the end of month, uh, a meeting of EU uh, heads of governments uh, on the issue of Russia and future relations with Russia. And obviously, this is uh, one of the key elements uh, 
uh, from our point of view as well, that if we would like to see in the future uh, sort of uh, constructive dialogue possible between uh, European nations and Russia, this cannot be uh, without uh, change uh, of Russia's policy towards uh, Ukraine, towards its neighbors. Uh, I can't imagine uh, any meaningful uh, and lasting uh, constructive dialogue with a country who occupying annexing uh, territories of its neighbors. So this is where Estonia is, of course, with uh, like-minded countries uh, keeping up the topic uh, on international level in different organizations. But bilaterally, I mean, uh, this is also very important uh, what we do uh, government to government, parliament to parliament, uh, but also uh, uh, NGOs and think tanks like Mitra EU, your uh, efforts uh, putting together this the very same program we uh, we using for our discuss the discussion today. And uh, Estonia is one of the leading countries uh, per capita in order to um, and, uh, development aid uh, assistance programs for Ukraine in general, including also uh, among them uh, what we can do uh, to help uh, uh, people uh, in Crimea or uh, related to, to, uh, uh, to Crimea. And uh, last but not least, I would like to say that this initiative, uh, what um, Ukrainian government uh, uh, announced uh, last autumn, uh, which is uh, uh, Crimea, Crimean plat platform is something which is, I, I, I guess, very uh, uh, timely, uh, very important uh, to show from uh, your own perspective uh, that uh, you are interested to bring uh, international community together uh, and discuss uh, uh, the fate of uh, Crimea and the future deoccupation of uh, Crimea. And uh, this platform, which, as I understand, uh, includes uh, different levels of uh, cooperation, international cooperation, is something where Estonia can uh, definitely have a uh, positive uh, input. Uh, we uh, uh, obviously uh, would be very active participants of, uh, of this uh, platform. And, uh, and of course, uh, we... Uh, should work uh, together uh, uh, to uh, keep the uh, topic uh, still on the radars of uh, our allies and partners. What happened in 2014, uh, February 2014, uh, was um, yeah, one of the examples where uh, multiple challenges in world politics can uh, be uh, a sort of reason where uh, in, in, uh, the, the, this kind of events can happen without uh, major, let's say, attention or readiness to react to. Because uh, as, as we remember 2014, February, uh, Ukraine and uh, specifically Crimea wasn't on the radars of uh, our allies in a way we needed to, them to, to, to have. But uh, I can confirm that uh, uh, both within NATO and uh, in other organizations, uh, as Ambassador mentioned as well, 2014 uh, made a quite a big change in terms of understanding how to uh, uh, analyze uh, the real uh, uh, sort of aims of uh, Russian foreign policy and how to stand together against uh, this aggressive uh, uh, aggressive foreign policy. Um, as I said, Estonia never will recognize uh, Crimea. Crimea is Ukraine and uh, we, of course, support uh, wholeheartedly all the efforts de-occupying de uh, Crimea. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Thank you for giving these uh, clear perspectives and uh, very 
concrete examples of the instruments Estonia is and will be using uh, uh, to support Ukraine's uh, agenda uh, internationally. And uh, as we know that, uh, of course, our support on international level and bilateral support uh, is very important. But there is a lot of homework to be done by our Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian friends themselves. And uh, of course, uh, all the strategies should be implemented into uh, concrete uh, actions. And, and therefore, uh, we are looking forward uh, for the next intervention. And we have today with us uh, Mr. Ihor Yeremenko, who is a Deputy Minister for Integration of the Temporary Occupied Territories of Ukraine. And of course, uh, a lot of expectations uh, are made um, towards uh, your ministry, Minister, have actually instrumentalized uh, uh, domestically uh, all the strategies and measures uh, provided and uh, how to, uh, uh, as I said uh, already, how to uh, implement uh, strategy of the occupation. And I know that during last years, uh, a lot of attention, also international attention, have been paid to the situation in Eastern Ukraine and maybe less uh, uh, on the situation in uh, occupied uh, occupied Crimea, and uh, uh, and of course your ministry has a lot of uh, task uh, to do. So uh, the floor is your minister, please. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, I believe you hear me well. So first of all, let me express my. Uh, Gratitude to my colleague, Ambassador Detsa, and uh, to the organizers uh, for having me today. Uh, it is my true honor and pleasure uh, to share with you my thoughts and views on, on the issue. Uh, at, at, at the beginning, let me also uh, convey my gratitude to uh, uh, my Estonian colleagues uh, in New York I used to work uh, at the permanent mission of Ukraine to the United Nations and uh, had a, a, an incredible pleasure to cooperate with my Estonian friends, with uh, definitely my greetings to your uh, permanent representative, uh, Mr. Sven Jorgensen, and, and my dear colleague, uh, Renata Sue, uh, and she's still working over there and she's doing absolutely excellent job. Uh, it, it, it happened that I uh, had a chance to be uh, a bit uh, connected to the issue of Crimea since uh, the very almost the very beginning, as I arrived in New York in 2015, early 2015, and that was the year when we uh, have started uh, our fight uh, in the uh, General Assembly, uh, let's say, for the first time. Uh, it's not a secret that uh, right after the uh, beginning of the Russian aggression in 2014, uh, it was a, a resolution of the GA adopted in March 2014 uh, regarding the, temp the um, uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, we, uh, after that resolution, uh, we have seen kind of a tendency, uh, and it was a narrative which was uh, presented by the Russian Federation that the issue of Crimea had been closed already. And uh, the Russians were trying to separate the issue of Crimea uh, from uh, the Donbass issue. Uh, and um, it, it was, uh, our great challenge to uh, uh, introduce the resolution of the General Assembly on the situation of human rights in Crimea. Uh, it was done uh, in 2016, but the first uh, joint statement supported by the Estonian friends was uh, in autumn uh, 2015. Uh, since then, you are uh, absolutely right that we have already five resolutions on the situation of human rights in Crimea and uh, 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 three resolutions on militarization of Crimea. Why those resolutions are so important for us? Um, probably now it's, it's time when I can be more frank than it was in 2016 when I was running between different delegations 
uh, and uh, trying to convince them um, why this resolution was so important. But, but uh, the, the main idea and the main purpose of that resolution was to uh, um, introduce on the UN level that uh, the territory of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sebastopol is a temporarily occupied territory, not annexed or illegally annexed as is as it uh, is quite use uh, quite uh, often used by uh, different actors. Um, and uh, now when I'm now working at the Ministry for Reintegration of the Temporarily Occupied Territories, uh, since the new team has entered the ministry, we have reshuffled uh, even the structure of the ministry, which will be a kind of a reply to uh, um, what had been said, uh, has said uh, the moderator. Uh, regarding uh, more focus on uh, Donbass and less focus on Crimea. So we have introduced the new logic of uh, the ministry and uh, we um, uh, decided to step away from the geographical approach, uh, which was used in the past when we had a, a special team uh, focused on Donbass and Crimea separately. Uh, and we have introduced, uh, let's say, a thematical approach. We have a, a, a one uh, team which is focused on the temporarily occupied territories, both on Crimea and Donbass. Uh, and we do not, let's say, uh, though there are, of course, uh, changes and, 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 and uh, let's say differences between these two regions. Uh, and one of them, uh, of course, is that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, occupation of Crimea was less bloody than Donbass. Uh, but nevertheless, we are uh, using the same approach to the temporarily occupied territories. And for us, it's extremely important. Uh, one of the biggest challenges last year was, of course, uh, the re-establishment of the ministry, and uh, we were uh, also struck by uh, the uh, pandemic, by the outbreak of the COVID-19, uh, facing a, a, a huge number of different challenges, uh, including uh, one of the biggest challenge, uh, the um, uh, crossing of the entry exit checkpoints, uh, both on the, uh, in the east and uh, in the south of Ukraine. So uh, for your understanding, in 2019, we had around roughly uh, 15 million crossings through those EECPs. At the beginning of 2020, uh, for the first uh, two and a half months before the introduction of the restrictions regarding the crossings, we had uh, around uh, 2.5 uh, crossings through the ECPs. For the uh, period of time uh, since uh, the mid of uh, uh, um, March till the end of uh, last year, uh, the number of uh, crossings through the ECPs has decreased to uh, uh, 500,000 approximately. The latest figure shows that uh, the uh, crossings are gradually uh, decreasing and uh, the latest uh, statistics which I have uh, so far uh, says that uh, since uh, 15th of uh, June uh, last year till 9th of uh, March, we had uh, uh, 110,000 uh, uh, crossings uh, from uh, Crimea to the mainland and 100,000 crossings from mainland to Crimea, which uh, it, as to my mind, it, it is uh, quite uh, telling uh, figures showing the uh, decrease of those crossings. And uh, I have to say that uh, the main um, uh, reason why it has happened uh, was uh, the decision taken by the Russian government to limit uh, crossings through the ECPs. 
It was uh, adopted in uh, March last year, and uh, it was allowed to the residents of Crimea to uh, cross the ECP uh, once per year uh, until the end of last year or until the end of uh, outbreak. Uh, why uh, they are doing so. Uh, it is uh, obvious they're trying to cut and limit those uh, connections uh, because of uh, uh, the intention to um, cut the peninsula from the mainland. Uh, the occupation authorities, they are doing their best to um, um, separate uh, as as much uh, uh, areas of cooperation as possible, beginning from the information issues. Uh, they have banned all uh, the uh, possible uh, broadcasting uh, TV channels, radio channels. Uh, uh, of course, they are banning uh, uh, social networks, uh, internet, and, and and so on and so forth. Uh, we are doing uh, now our best to what, what we are doing this year. Um, we're trying to uh, support uh, broadcasting uh, TV channels and radio channels. And uh, just a couple of hours ago, it was a decision taken by the cabinet of ministers, uh, uh, which now has adopted a special decree uh, uh, allowing to the ministry basically to provide the financial support to those uh, broadcasters. Um, what we are also trying to do, we definitely working with the entry exit checkpoints. That was our uh, one of the biggest challenges because uh, we have to establish a, a common standard which will be uh, disseminated to all the ECPs, uh, to all the uh, temporarily occupied territories. And uh, we expect that in the nearest future, we will uh, uh, open the new service area, uh, uh, one of the uh, checking points with uh, Crimea in Changar. Definitely, uh, we are um, monitoring situation with the human rights uh, on on uh, on the peninsula sharing that information with the international community with uh, and uh, especially with the uh, monitor mission un monitor mission deployed in ukraine since uh, 2014 uh, we also suggesting uh, 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 sanction regimes uh, to those who are violating uh, rights of the residents in uh, crimea uh, with uh, regard to the uh, Crimea pa uh, Crimean platform, which will happen the, uh, um, further this year, um, uh, as a ministry, we are not uh, intend to go there with uh, an empty hands, basically. But we are uh, have um, we have uh, a number of uh, tasks, uh, and one of the biggest uh, challenge for us is to. Uh, present the new legislation, which uh, is about the, it is, um, it has now uh, a, a name, a title, uh, the um, legislation for the transitional period. This legislation aims to provide answers, basically, uh, first of all, to those who are residing on the temporarily occupied territories with regard to what will happen when the uh, the uh, when uh, those territories will be deoccupied, honestly, I am receiving quite uh, often uh, uh, letters uh, from uh, our citizens uh, from the temporarily occupied territories, asking simple questions: What will happen wh with me uh, if I took, for example, a passport of the Russian Federation? Because I, I, I was imposed to to take that passport, especially in Crimea, uh, what will happen with me? Because I want to live in Ukraine. I, 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 I uh, um, consider myself as Ukrainian and uh, my future is connected with Ukraine. And uh, this legislation, this draft law, which we are intent to, to present to the parliament uh, um, at the beginning of uh, summer, um, 
it it uh, it has an intention to give the answer. Mm, that draft of the law had been published already. It is uh, uh, um, available on the website of the ministry since the end of December last year. We have already received uh, uh, many uh, feedback uh, on that draft legislation, including from the international organizations and uh, uh, such uh, as UN uh, and from our uh, bilateral partners as well. So uh, you're feel free to uh, take a look on that draft law. Uh, now we're working on those amendments which we have received already, and it will be a bit, of course, reshuffled uh, and uh, reshaped. And uh, we expect to. Uh, introduce that uh, draft legislation uh, somewhere in June to uh, to the parliament. Um, another, um, probably I can speak a lot, but I'll, I'll try to um, somehow um, limit myself. Uh, I will touch upon the issue of uh, support of uh, the indigenous people uh, of Crimea, uh, we are now drafting the um, legislation on the indigenous people as well. It will be presented uh, hopefully next month. Um, as well as we have already introduced the draft concept uh, on the support of uh, uh, the development of the Crimean Tatar language. It is also our challenge for uh, our ministry uh, we, we want to support uh, Crimean Tatars, and we are in a close cooperation with the Majlis of Crimean Tatar people. Uh, and uh, we have foreseen the financial support for that uh, as well for this year. So uh, um, the development of Crimean Tatar language will receive the financial support. Uh, we uh, also uh, intend to, to continue this year uh, um, our um, cooperation with the international partners in order to uh, bring uh, um, international uh, partners to the border uh, with uh, Crimea. Unfortunately, uh, so far, uh, many international partners a bit scared to visit the uh, border with uh, Crimea, uh, and uh, we expect that, uh, for example, uh, Estonia and France will uh, visit the uh, border. It is extremely important for us to show that the issue of Crimea is not closed, uh, and uh, we are absolutely convinced that uh, Crimea will be uh, deoccupied one day. Uh, probably I will stop myself at this point. I will be happy to uh, provide answers or comments if uh, such will be needed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you for this uh, very uh, detailed overview. And actually, you already answered several questions we received in advance. Uh, 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 I guess without actually knowing that, but one question was related uh, uh, to the role of uh, uh, ethnic communities of the occupied Crimea, so basically Crimean and Tatars, uh, their role in uh, international communication and uh, in the strategic uh, Ukraine's narrative. So that's uh, very, uh, uh, very good that you already addressed uh, uh, that question. And I guess, of course, uh, your examples, how Russia is trying uh, to prevent uh, any type of communication uh, between uh, the uh, citizens of Ukraine on occupied and uh, territories and main lines, so basically to prevent face-to-face uh, -face communications and uh, to prevent uh, media communications. I think it's a very good indicator uh, of their fear, uh, what actually uh, they, uh, they witness. But uh, let me switch now to another speaker, and we have with us uh, Mr. Gertansu, who served as the Estonian ambassador to Ukraine uh, from 2016 to 19. And of course, uh, Gert has a lot of uh, practical knowledge uh, 
about uh, the actual situation uh, in uh, Ukraine in different regions. And now Gerd works as the director of the Estonian Center for Eastern Partnership. This is the organization which implements uh, different projects also focused on uh, regions uh, which uh, border uh, the occupied territories in the east uh, and the south of Ukraine. And uh, I guess uh, Gert is very knowledgeable uh, to uh, address the question of maybe success stories or maybe some challenges which are related uh, to the uh, occupation of Crimea. Gert, the floor is yours and thank you for being with us. Gert, I think uh, we should unmute you. Uh, in that case, uh, we can hear you because without voice, it's quite challenging. Okay. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, yeah, it's working now. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me over, and always a pleasure, uh, especially on those in those difficult days. Um, uh, it's it's very good to to meet people at least um, electronically and to discuss those important um, questions. Let me start more broadly. And um, um, of course, I, I very much want to agree. I want to be as clear as, as Marco Mikkelsen was. Um, uh, obviously, Estonia will will continue the non-recognition policy of, of Russian annexation. And um, I'm sure the, the annexation, the occupation will end one day and we are all working in in that direction and well the same applies not only to estonia but but the whole civil as well for that matter and it is important to keep discussing those questions um in order not to forget them well, even, even if there is no daily fighting um, going on like in, in donbas for example and especially so as the situation on the ground is rather grim as the ambassador pointed out from the militarization of the region to arbitrary detention, detentions and, and violence against uh, Ukrainians, especially Ukrainian Tatars, and heavy discrimination against the Ukrainian language and all that, so which is basically an, a daily breach of Russia's international obligations and which is resulting in misery for many people. So uh, we should all stand firm uh, and the EU and, and the US and others uh, should continue the sanctions regime until the eventual reunification of the Crimea with Ukraine and discussing about easing the sanctions obviously um, do not make much sense. Well, that also has, uh, has practical implications. Also, all countries that are parties to the sanctions have to walk the walk, uh, so to say, and, and implement them. At the moment, well, it has been somewhat uh, publicized in the Estonian media as well that the Estonian uh, investigative authorities are um, investigating uh, breach of sanctions uh, by an Estonian um, company or companies um, working in, in Ukraine, having an Estonian owner and approaching this matter very seriously and uh, coming to, um, well, um, to, 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 uh, to an end result which would uh, discourage any such behavior in the future, of course, is very important. Uh, looking at it from the Estonian side, we are, we are currently a non-permanent member of the United Nations, so uh, we, we have been raising uh, the, the Crimean question at the um, in, uh, informal ARIA formula meeting last year and we are doing it this year as well, co-hosting the, the meeting. Um, and one area um, uh, where it has been going rather well for Ukraine, which I, which I should mention, is um, Ukraine's activities in the international courts, the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights. And I believe this gives both Ukraine and others also belief that um, gross, gross violations of international law it's, it's not completely cost-free. And I hope that 
friendly countries like Estonia, for example, uh, could lend their hand with their own expertise in the matter. Although, on the other hand, it seems to me that Ukraine is becoming sort of an sort of an international law superpower, and soon others can take lessons from Ukraine uh, from its uh, successful defense of in its interests in international courts. But um, I believe many countries are are ready to. Uh, uh, to give a hand, and um, of course, I'm looking forward to um, Professor Subulenko's intervention on uh, that matter. And indeed, I have to agree with Marco Mikkelsen once again that uh, one possible means, and the ambassador for that matter, uh, one possible means of working together to keep the world's attention on the Crimean topic would be the Crimean platform, as uh, suggested by Ukraine and Estonia, certainly interested in, 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 in it, and we are looking forward to to more detailed information, but also ready to play an active role. But Mitri, more directly to a question uh, about how Estonia and others can support, uh, besides the political support and sanctions. Uh, certainly, one main avenue here is contributing to the cause of reforms in Ukraine. This means Kiev, uh, where the course of the country is ultimately decided but also the regions. And even if we cannot work in the Crimea today, but we can contribute to, make, to making Ukraine work better in the south of the country, including in the bordering Kherson region, indeed. And, well, one reason is rather obvious, uh, the more rapidly Ukraine develops, the more attractive it becomes as a role model and as a potential destination for the Crimeans, but also, in the broader sense, uh, the more successful Ukraine becomes, the less attractive the authoritarian and the arbitrary state capitalism type of state model becomes, as practiced and uh, preached by Russia. So uh, for this to work, everyone would have to see the difference between the two systems. And for this, uh, people's trust towards their own country and its government, of course, are essential. Uh, to improve this, the Estonian Central Eastern Partnership is working currently in two main areas in the Kherson region, if we concentrate on that. Uh, first, we are helping to fight disinformation. Obviously, the enemy is strong at creating its own myths, and it often finds, unfortunately, a receptive audience. So our experts work together with Ukrainians to learn to recognize disinformation, uh, narratives created by the other side, and uh, we train local journalists who often are the category of people uh, the ordinary people still trust most. So uh, working together with them, telling them about our experiences in the fight against disinformation, but also, for example, um, our experiences as a member of the European Union. We have been members now for 17 years soon. And um, I think most of those myths about Europe uh, have been well forgotten in Estonia, but many of them, as um, also amplified by Russia, are still well alive in, in Ukraine. And when you, when you talk to, to journalists, to people in the regions about those myths, and also when you share the Estonian experience, everyone kind of, kind of um, well, answers back that, um, uh, really, well, we didn't know it's, it's so... Um, obviously positive, the, the membership uh, experience for Estonia. We thought it was more kind of ambiguous. Uh, so one, one has to share those experiences. Secondly, we are starting, or we have just started, a project enhancing local governance. And the Kherson region is, is really our focal point here in Ukraine. And one of the reasons, actually, we, we chose Kherson was that, well, it, of course, the willingness of the region to work with us, but also its proximity to the Crimea and the possibility to, uh, to make um, a wider point out of it. So um, people in the regions, in their own municipalities, uh, they, they need to feel that they have a stake in, in their own country, in their own uh, municipality, and that authorities care about them and that they themselves can make a difference by voting, uh, by being active in their home village, 
town, Gromada, and for this, for them to, to feel that, to, and for them to be active, well, they, they have to feel that life is, is changing for the better. So we have put together a team that includes current and former Estonian mayors, quite a number of them, and those people go to their partners. Well, we haven't kicked it off yet in Ukraine. We started it uh, from Georgia, and they, um, they listen to local needs, and according to those needs, then one can either help with the creation of a development plan and think it together, th think it over together. Uh, where does the municipality want to go? How does it intend to get there? And from the Estonian side, then we can share our own experiences of our constant improvement of local governance uh, over the last 30 years, and then offer our help with the management, uh, water management, for example, or, or waste management, things which perhaps from the greater point of international law, the, the fight against uh, the Russian uh, aggressor, uh, seem so much less important, but then they are very close to the people, and actually they they are very important. And in the end, if we get those things to work, then people are less likely to leave. People, uh, well, the place is likelier to succeed, and um, um, that's that's the reason why we we keep working. And even if I say that, of course, the, still the work in the in the capital, especially on the rule of law, uh, remains um, equally important. And as regards the Crimea, well, I hope one day Estonia can share its experiences uh, in the Crimea as well. Uh, my very last point, um, one more thing I wanted to mention, is the importance of communication and giving information to people, establishing mutual trust and, and keeping a, a contact with the people and these days, you know, communication is even more difficult than, than before uh, because of COVID and obviously communicating, communicating with the Crimea to the Crimea is difficult because of the annexation. But still, uh, mass media has an important role to play. And even if TV seems to be a bit old fashioned compared to all those online um, nice things we have these days, um, actually, well, you know very well, um, in Ukraine, TV remains very important, and in communication with the Crimea as well. So um, the um, ATR TV channel used to serve as a, as a very good communication model, and it was a good example of uh, private ownership and at the same time public support. And I should say that um, it would be useful to, to keep um, making use of that um, channel um, now and, and in the future as well. I'm not sure it, it works in the, in the best um, manner today, but of course, um, those speaking from Kiev can, can correct me if I'm wrong. It, it seems really a, um, a waste not to, not to use that channel. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, once more, uh, once again, um, honor to, to take part in the panel and let's keep up the fight and uh, and we will win one day, as said one Estonian freedom fighter who celebrates his um, 85th birthday this week, or was it last week? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gert. Uh, thank you for uh, providing uh, very inspiring uh, examples, actually, how political support on the international level uh, is being materialized into concrete uh, actions uh, in Ukraine and uh, actions actually noticed and uh, felt by uh, local people. And I think uh, those two are very, I mean, equally important if you have the political support and then uh, very uh, particular projects uh, seen uh, and appreciated by different local communities. And uh, you already made, made very good introduction uh, for the next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Yevhen Subulenko. And uh, Yevhen, uh, well, I would like uh, you to address uh, several topics. One, and of course, international law, uh, of which you are a uh, knowledgeable expert, but uh, maybe you can also touch upon uh, some legal implications uh, of uh, the current uh, actions uh, in Crimea, like 
like passportization and also drafting to the uh, to the Russian army. I mean, uh, what legal implications or consequences can uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, see in the future, according to your opinion? Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, dear participants, good afternoon. Dmitry, thank you for the invitation. Actually, as here in Estonia, we have possibility to speak Ukrainian only among uh, diaspora members and the embassy. I really would like to take that opportunity to speak some Ukrainian. Uh, translation anyway provided. Uh, so, Shannon uh, Edul, with Iowa's. Dear friends, I can wish you indeed. If we speak about the Russian aggression in Ukraine, there were a lot of uh, legal aspects, as it was mentioned before, uh, that there were several international courts that considered these issues, but in fact, there are much more international courts, uh, arbitrations, that, that, cons that consider Ukrainian cases. So I'd like to speak briefly about them in form all the participants of the presence about the about the we we'll start, we'll start from the Hague because they consider the most number of international cases first of all the, the international court where they where they there are cases so Ukraine versus Russia and uh, and so we have a case uh, that Russia uh, uh, violated many conventions, conventions of uh, so concerning the racial discrimination. And so at the same time, uh, there is a letter from the, from the court that the court will consider this case. Should be remarked that international international justice is a very lengthy process, quite quite inert. But at the same time, it's a, it's a, it's a very positive sign because, because it's a, it's a very heavy life field. All it takes time and efforts to make it rotate. Uh, then, if it started to rotate, it's very hard to stop this fly. Well, on the other hand. The, the other court in the, that is considering the case of Ukraine versus Russian Federation and its aggression, uh, both in uh, Crimea and Donbass. It's International Criminal Court in uh, Hague, uh, which task is to punish the uh, directly the criminals that are guilty of committing crimes of uh, military crimes or crimes against humanity theoretically in the future uh, this court will uh, consider uh, crimes against peace but it's not but I think it's possible for, for some reasons for now International Criminal Court has finished, finished its investigation recommended this case for regular uh, investigation and court trial. What it should be noted that the International Court of Criminal Court, but that was in Crimea and in Donbass, which is very important. There is international armed conflict between Ukraine and Russian Federation. And in addition, in, in The Hague, we have a permanent chamber of the arbitration court. And they consider several cases so versus private bank versus Russian Federation and in the case of, of the countries of the Black Sea region and the next significant center is Strasbourg. Strasbourg. There are several cases uh, considered over there. I mean, the International Court for Human Rights, and they consider several cases of U Ukraine versus Russia. Yeah, there is a joint joint case of Ukraine and Netherlands versus Russia. And there are several individual uh, complaints of uh, claims of Ukrainian citizens against Russian Federation. It's very perspective uh, direction of uh, punishing Russian Federation for violating human rights. 
both in Crimea and Donbass. And, and of course, we should take, we should mention another case. It's, it's, it's an international maritime tribunal in the case for seizure Ukrainian uh, naval ships. There was an incident in the Strait of Kerch that took when Ukrainian uh, boats were attacked by by the Russian Federation vessels. They did it without hiding their intentions. And of course, I would like to mention by Paris. There's it is less known, but uh, but they have international arbitration court there. And Russia Bank of Ukraine uh, has a trial against Russian Federation same principle. This it sounds a bit weird, but but the arbitration is sometimes more efficient than than the regular international courts because in the international courts lack. Uh, some uh, powerful instruments of enforcement. So, if one of the parties uh, don't want to perform the court rulings, there's in case of Russia. But speaking of arbitration, the situation is quite peculiar. Even if the Russian Federation fails to perform their rulings, then the, then the property of Russia will be arrested, and and it will cause a lot of problems to Russian Federation. So if you look back in the history and, and, and just remember the mobile versus Russia case, that was a pure commercial uh, uh, trial. For instance, the Russian uh, aircrafts could not visit La Bourge and other aircraft zones because otherwise it would be arrested. So international arbitration. All they know this. Uh, famous is uh, international courts. They sometimes the enforcement mechanism can can be much more efficient. And regarding the uh, violations of human rights in Crimea, international humanitarian law, which is known as law in armed conflicts, because of the uh, military conflict in Crimea. And in Geneva Convention specifies that occupation on the part of the country, even if it's it doesn't meet any military oppression, isn't uh, should be regarded in international armed conflict. And that, as it was also mentioned in the in the materials of the International Criminal Court. So, due to this fact, we can say that this situation is considered to be a wartime situation. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to to restrictions of of the movement of the civilians of of the civilians of the uh, occupying country. So, what is done by Russia is not a test. It's true for Crimea, but it's uh, but it's true for in, through the entire territory uh, history of Russian Federation. Very often, the occupied territories then they move significant number of population. To the occupied territories, and and then the, there are children born to these uh, people, and the Russians start to claim that this is our territory. They, they protest this in uh, Baltic states and in Estonia, for instance. And historically, if you look at the, the time of collapse of Russian creation before the World War, one, there were four percent of Russian population in Estonia, and after the after the October Revolt. And first, uh, World War First, a lot of uh, people flew, fled from Russia, from Bolsheviks to uh, Russia, uh, to Estonia. And the population, Russian population has increased to 8%, but starting from the occupation of 1940, Estonia, where uh, a lot of uh, Russian population was imported to Estonia, and the, and the percentage increased to 30%, in, even more in Latvia. Italian, the po in, La in Latin, there were 40% of Russian population. So now you can imagine the scale of uh, relocation. The same happens to Crimea. 
And at the time of occupation uh, in 2014, the population of Crimea was less than a bit less than two million persons. And currently, at the beginning of uh, 2021, the number, according to your Russian statistics, this figure is is uh, comprises two and a half million. So it means that by quarter, the population of Crimea has increased over these years. These are the official data, but of course, they do not um, meet the real because the Russian Federation continuously falsifies it for this information. And in this, uh, this statistic do not include military servicemen. However, uh, well, we have to understand that Russia brought not only a lot of servicemen to Crimea, but 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 other law enforcement uh, officers like as FSB police. This figure is much, much bigger. And you can see, look, you can uh, look at the statistics of the occupied Sevastopol. This statistic is more versatile. If we look at the beginning of the beginning of the occupation, the population of Sevastopol was 390,000 persons by the beginning of 2021. Again, according to Russian Federation statistics, the population of, of Sevastopol is 510,000. So it increased almost by 25%. But again, these are the official figures. I have other statistics, including with the statement of the architectural department of the Sevastopol city. The population of the city is more than 600,000 inhabitants. It's increased by, by 50%. But the most interesting statistic uh, the, or the calculations made by our governor is such practical things uh, is the consumption of bread by the population and, and which is very interesting and and very eloquent factor so according to this calculation the population of first of all is is seven seven to eight hundred thousand people so almost two times bigger than the beginning beginning of occupation. So we see that Russia uh, is trying to change the demographic landscape of Crimea. And uh, we know that you know, but the deportation of the Crimean Tatars from Crimea, the houses of Crimean Tatars were populated by Russian, by inhabitants of Russian Federation. Uh, and from Crimea, they deported not only crime uh, Tatars, but many other ethnicities. And uh, for instance, Germans, Italians, Greeks, Armenians, Carolini, etc. So in fact, the Crimea was depopulated. And after that, they brought in uh, populations from the Russia mainly. Sevastopol was used. Was used as uh, in the in the past, it was it's it's a, it was a accumulator of, of military pensioners from Russia, especially naval pensioners, and of course now this uh, this population they cry that they are indigenous population of Crimea, and of course, in fact, this is not true. If you look at the you know, these consensus and uh, during the Russian Empire. But we see that big. So the, there was no well, I mean, majority of Russian Russians back then. It means that during the Russian Empire times, so, so many Belarusian Ukrainians were indicated as Russians as well. But this is a very dangerous trend. It, cha it changes demographic landscape of the territory, which is a direct violation of Geneva Convention international humanitarian law as a whole uh, in addition we have we also mentioned the illegal illegal uh, draft uh, drafting of young people which is for uh, prohibited by general commissions there are a lot of mm, other violations and this is the now, this is uh, quite an important document by United Nations Organization on the Human Rights Committee where they list a number of violations. And this document is, is uh, used as the guideline. 
because it contains practical examples of all possible violations of human rights that exist. So if you want to, if you want to hold, uh, if you provide practical examples, you can take this uh, report and use it as as a. Зараз російські окупанти дуже активно використовують це питання, кажуть, що Україна перекрила воду, що Україна робить якийсь геноцид кримського населення. Звичайно, треба розуміти, що пітної води для населення Криму завжди вистачало. Цій води не вистачає, по-перше, для цього нового погалів'я, яке завозиться в Крим, а також для військових об'єктів – та промисловості, яка працює в тому числі а, на військово-промисловий комплекс Російської Федерації. Тобто ця проблема, вона повністю а, надумана окупантами, і, звичайно, найпростіше рішення, просто окупанти пішли, і тоді Україна зможе розпочати знову постачання води до Криму. Але знову ж таки а, хочу підкреслити, що пітної води для населення Криму вистачає, тобто ніякої гуманітарної катастрофи тут в цьому сенсі немає. Не вистачає для збільшення населення і для військової інфраструктури російських окупантів. Ну, а, в принципі, про Крим ще можна багато говорити, але тому що у нас є інші а, учасники. Ми можемо говорити багато про Криму, але якщо є питання, я буду відповідати всі. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you already for answering uh, one of the questions we received. Uh, uh, it concerned uh, actually the water supply to the occupied peninsula. Uh, I know that uh, one of the participants addressed that question in Britain and uh, of course we know uh, the uh, actual situation as you described it and uh, also this uh, issue of uh, water supply is very much uh, abused uh, in uh, anti-Ukrainian and pro-Kremlin uh, pr propaganda uh, campaign. So uh, thank you very much for uh, addressing it and uh, answering that, uh, that questions. We have another questions regarding uh, actually the sanctions, but we will address them a little bit later because we have two more uh, speakers, very interesting speakers. Uh, who will address uh, the issue of uh, disinformation and actually the uh, situation regarding the uh, human rights uh, of uh, ethnic minorities. And uh, I would like to give a floor to uh, Mr. Volodymyr Pritula, who is a uh, head of the Crimean desk uh, at the uh, outlet Krim Reality. And uh, Volodymyr, you with us. Thank you very much for being with us. and. Uh, how would you describe uh, the uh, long-term effects of uh, Crimean-led uh, or Crimean origin uh, disinformation operations against uh, Ukraine? Uh, hello, everybody. I, uh, uh, I'm grateful uh, to be part of this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I would not like to uh, assess some uh, of the questions uh, that uh, already been discussed. It's uh, about the Crimean uh, platform. I'm a journalist, and uh, I say uh, that this uh, very topic is being discussed in the Crimea uh, all over um, on the level uh, of the occupation uh, administration and uh, uh, on the level of the Crimean citizens. We know know about uh, the uh, Aksyonov's and uh, Konstantinov's uh, hysterical uh, statements about uh, 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 how uh, the media discusses uh, the uh, different uh, issues uh, concerning this. And we see that the uh, issue of uh, uh, making uh, this uh, founding of the uh, Crimean uh, platform is being discussed because the simple, plain uh, people are uh, worried about it uh, together with uh, all uh, these uh, issues. I agree with the experts uh, because the topic of the water is not very uh, crucial and uh, 
uh, the topic that is uh, very important, but uh, uh, still uh, it's the thing that uh, the problem with water will uh, evolve uh, sooner or later. Uh, it is uh, more difficult now, but still uh, this uh, problem is uh, actually um, um, and becomes uh, uh, more acute because uh, of the new population coming in, because of the military uh, coming in, and uh, also by the uh, industry that uh, is being uh, brought here about uh, uh, new uh, military and uh, construction uh, industry uh, in order to build uh, infrastructure, different uh, uh, highways, uh, actually, uh, whatever is needed for a big uh, military base in the Crimea. But uh, the people uh, are worried when uh, the repressions uh, will stop against the Crimean Tatars, about other nationalities. Uh, nationalities. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, they are directed uh, uh, against in, uh, indigenous uh, people, the Crimean Tatars, who did not actually accept uh, this uh, occupation against Ukrainians, uh, against uh, the uh, politicians and uh, NGO activists, uh, the ones that uh, had to leave the uh, peninsula in 2014 through 2016. And uh, now it's against anybody who is not happy about the life of uh, the Crimea. So probably these people uh, actually <laughs> had uh, uh, agreed and uh, were happy about this uh, uh, occupation. But now they are not very happy because of the social problems and uh, uh, they uh, are also directed uh, against this repressive machine. And uh, the people uh, who uh, felt this repressive machines, machine was the journalists as well. And uh, I would like uh, to say that only in our project, uh, Crimea Reali, uh, more than 50 uh, journalists, about 60, they uh, actually got uh, the pressure from uh, Russian special services. And uh, many of them uh, actually had to quit uh, the Crimea Realia because uh, they had uh, to leave. And uh, 29 uh, people also had to leave the Crimean uh, Peninsula. Somebody in 2014, like myself, I really had to flee. And uh, some of them uh, later, like Mikola Smola, uh, our blogger, the one that uh, actually about one year ago in February, uh, he was uh, able, he was not able to uh, leave uh, the Crimea. He was uh, detained uh, to uh, 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 he, he, he had to stay in the Crimea and uh, he, for three uh, years. And uh, only now uh, was he able to leave, and uh, he uh, actually was able to um, uh, to get to the crime, uh, to the uh, journalist profession. The ones uh, who actually work in the Crimea, uh, the journalists, they work illegally. Uh, they risk not only their uh, liberty but also their lives. We know many cases when the journalists uh, were abducted and uh, uh, they uh, had a serious danger uh, about their lives. And uh, now we can say that uh, uh, those journalists uh, who we uh, say the civic journalists, the ones that uh, had never uh, written before that uh, uh, did not take pictures, they did not make money uh, for this, but they do spread information uh, about what's happening uh, in the Crimea. And there are dozens of those uh, in, uh, in the Crimea. Many of them uh, have been uh, detained and put in jail for 
very bad uh, articles and they uh, are uh, destined to be in jail for 10, 15 or 20 years. And uh, these are Nariman, uh, Namedinov, uh, Bekirov, uh, Mehmetov, Shekhelyev and many uh, other uh, people who actually uh, sent uh, the information and uh, there were uh, different searches, seizures uh, in the Crimea and they uh, risked their lives uh, and uh, they lost uh, their uh, freedom and these people deserve uh, our attention i'm not going to talk a lot uh, about how to counteract uh, the russian propaganda all the media are uh, under strict control of the russian uh, pressure and uh, whoever has uh, this uh, brevity uh, courage to counteract uh, this they will end up uh, in jail like Ivan Ayorotsky uh, he was uh, sent uh, from the Crimea from uh, the, from uh, Russia although he uh, also is a Ukrainian uh, citizens but uh, actually he uh, he uh, actually supported this uh, Russian spring, but uh, when uh, he uh, started to speak uh, a little bit uh, different, uh, then he um, uh, was deprived uh, of all that. Or other uh, people, they also were pro-Russian first, but then their uh, activity uh, contradicted uh, the official line. Then uh, they were uh, arrested uh, and they were in jail and uh, th these were some uh, uh, accusations that uh, you never know uh, what they were and uh, actually that's uh, that complicates uh, uh, getting uh, good normal uh, precise information uh, Crimea really and these uh, are three websites in three uh, languages, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and uh, Crimean Tatar. And uh, it was important for us to have uh, this uh, information uh, provided for the Crimean residents. And uh, uh, when we, uh, several years later, we also felt uh, pressure uh, through blocking our websites. Uh, periodically, our websites are blocked in 2016, it was uh, blocked completely. Now only some providers block them, but uh, uh, about three, uh, about uh, 30 Ukrainian uh, websites are blocked uh, there as well. So besides uh, this pressure on the journalists uh, who work in the Crimea, uh, the Russian authorities want to uh, somehow uh, limit uh, uh, incoming of uh, Ukrainian journalists, international uh, journalists, and there were uh, dozens of cases when they were deported uh, from the Crimea. Several of our colleagues from Crimean realia, they were also deported. Uh, Taras Ibrahimov, uh, for example, uh, he, he uh, has a prohibition ban to come into the Crimea for 50 years. Uh, he covered the stories uh, on the uh, um, hearings, um, uh, courts, and uh, there were some other uh, people who uh, were prohibited to enter the Crimea for five, ten years. And uh, because of this, on the one hand, Ukrainian audience does not receive or receives uh, uh, in limited uh, uh, value uh, uh, the information. On the other hand, the Crimean residents uh, are in the uh, information ghetto and uh, they don't receive uh, good information. Now, there is a, uh, uh, an issue of uh, strengthening, controlling of the internet in Russia about uh, the 
dissemination of information, uh, the true information uh, all over Russian Federation and uh, the Crimea. So it complicates uh, the work, uh, how to uh, uh, counteract this propaganda. Uh, and uh, we have to think uh, how to uh, get uh, these uh, Crimean uh, residents to receive uh, the uh, information. So as uh, they get the access uh, to widely receive the information and with this uh, information uh, and uh, to understand what to do and uh, how to act uh, with it. So we uh, receive and we communicate uh, our colleagues, uh, although we are uh, on the mainland uh, Ukraine, we still are with uh, our colleagues, uh, with uh, the representatives of uh, our audience, and all of them say that uh, here we have a society complicated uh, issues about being uh, and people so sobering uh, so as uh, they uh, realize what uh, that something wrong happened uh, seven years ago but still uh, the crimean residents still uh, are disoriented uh, by the information and it complicates their lives which is uh, uh, actually not that uh, good and it's complicated sorry for taking uh, much time and uh, it was my pleasure thank you very much for your insights and actually for sharing uh, personal stories because uh, i am convinced that uh, those stories of uh, people who lived or who still live in the occupied crimea those stories uh, must be heard uh, not just uh, in Ukraine, uh, but also worldwide and uh, among citizens of, uh, of free countries. And uh, that is our uh, small contribution also by uh, sharing these personal stories and uh, insights. As actually pointed out by other speakers previously, communication uh, is one of the uh, key instruments uh, and communi free uh, communication is something which aggressor and uh, Russia is very afraid of. And uh, our uh, last speaker for today is uh, Mr. Ibrahim Suleimanov, and uh, he is a head of uh, Kherson City Majelis and also a development director of Kuryash Crimean Tatar Cultural Center there. And of course, it's very difficult to overestimate uh, negative consequences of the Crimean occupation uh, to your people, Ibrahim. And uh, obviously, uh, it's uh, up to you to assess uh, what those consequences in the long term can be and how uh, we as uh, friends of Ukraine uh, or how uh, Ukrainian authorities uh, could help uh, in order to uh, reestablish your uh, ethnic communities and, your, uh, and support your culture. The floor is yours, Ibrahim. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we lack time. I will, I will make my, uh, I will shorten my, my speech. I'd like to tell you how Russian Federation creates hot points and and instigates population and then impose their rights rules especially it was done by uh by our situation in crimea of this i will skip this part because all of you are aware how the russian uh, citizenship was was imposed on the local population and uh, I'll uh, speak, uh, focus on more on, a, on some points that are not well known, but they but they require some closer attention today. 
So, in addition to what the, the fact that 100% of Crimean population uh, have received their Russian citizenship, there is a strong. There, are, there is a fact that that, that uh, many Ukrainian citizens come to Ukraine to get the Russian citizenship. So, who are these people? Some of these people have uh, real estate in Crimea, or, so they're trying to preserve that property. Most of the people, people that have uh, that own property in Crimea, they're not some laymen. They just most of them are uh, official. Some of the prosecutors are judges. Some of them have access to state secret. In my opinion. We need to urgently regulate this uh, issue. First of all, uh, so legislature should be adopted to identify this person and prohibit them from taking the uh, position uh, and represent the country on different levels. They become dependent, they become vulnerable, and it means they, they become toxic. And, when it comes to taking decisions regarding the national security, and the conditions of undeclared war. So first, first steps were made in this direction, uh, and the decision of the first steps were made to, to regulate this problem. But this decision is, is proper, but it, it weak in terms of enforcement. Yeah. So, uh, Council uh, National Defense uh, and Security Council has made decision, uh, decision to prohibit the citizens of Ukraine to, to pretend the performance or the function of the government or become the members of the local authorities. I think so. I think we should do, this should be implemented in short period in just six months. Another threat for for Ukraine. The threat is that the attempt of the Russian Federation to protect their their citizens from anybody, from virtual by the bandeirity as a NATO countries. The topic of anti-NATO movement is was generously sponsored by Russian Federation, and has a, and it's a formal pretext for the for the government to protect their citizens in the territory of other countries. This, there is another issue such as uh, con draft, drafting the young people and to the armed forces of Russian Federation and and that is it's quite uh, this issue is quite famous and it's and we need to we need to keep uh, and close eye on that because it's, um, not many citizens of Ukraine understand the specificity of what is going on in, in Crimea today. One of the consequences of uh, get, uh, obtaining the citizenship is that, is that the citizens can be drafted to your, your armed forces of Russian Federation. This is quite this, uh, innovative process for young people. In accordance with the Russian Federation laws, they are obliged to be to become conscript soldiers, and for and uh, in order uh, during the first years of occupation, they were not forced to do that. In the uh, they could be in, uh, couldn't be drafted to local forces, but now they have two options: either to serve in the Russian uh, army or move to to another part of Russian Federation. So, otherwise, they will be criminally punished, uh, prosecuted for dodging the service, and they won't be able, won't be able to get back to Crimean territory in, in, the, in the future. Because otherwise, they will be punished, but persecuted criminally. And they won't be able to communicate with their members of family or travel to Crimea. Believe me, for many of young people. It's quite a tough choice. And human rights activists speak about 100, 
135 criminal cases instigated. But I believe there are much more cases than 135. And so in December, General Assembly of the United Nations Organization has made a draft resolution, adopted draft resolution, when they, uh, when they accused such um, uh, malicious practices. They expressed uh, concerns uh, for the militarization of the preschool education. This process is getting a more uh, greater scale. As the color of war poses the threat to psychological uh, health of uh, young, uh, young people. So everything starts from the preschool education, then in, then in, back, then in school they pro uh, the militarism is promoted, and, and so Russian uh, Russian Federation actively supports the uh, UN Army Organization. So the child, without critical thinking, is uh, is subjected subjected to propaganda. So throughout the education history, they become. They become like a big, they become just uh, soldiers, future soldiers of the army, Russian army. So, so we should not just observe this. Uh, so we need to make some sort of decisions. So for, so there are there are certain persons behind this force of argument. Every one of them has a name. And they is trying to zombie local populations. So what should we do? We need, we need, we need to we need to adopt a law, identify who is responsible for what, and and so we need to identify whether it should be considered by a crime or not. So the so the call for militarism, the call for seven the arms operation should be considered as the crime, and it entail criminal or administrative. Uh, responsibility. I would like to ask maybe a technical issue. I just received some, some. Is it possible to share my screen to show you some interesting and facts? It's the agenda of celebrating the days of Crimean uh, Spring. You see, the, this is the, curric uh, the curricula, school curricula. So Russia, Russia, the Russia has added Crimea and saved Slavs. So Crimean Tatars is the third that ethnic population in Crimea. The Ukrainians are totally removed from this list. It shows, obviously, the, the state of affairs in Crimea today. And uh, so the information, personal policy, and educational domain should, should be a major concern for Ukrainian government. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Thank you Ibrahim. These uh, insights and uh, also very interesting uh, stories, and uh, I think uh, there are uh, quite uh, clear evidences about uh, Russia using its repressive and propagandistic measures uh, against uh, Crimean Tatars and uh, other pro Ukrainian people in occupied Crimea. And uh, obviously, uh, those who support that uh, should be uh, count uh, uh, responsible. And uh, we have received more than 20 questions. And of course, due to uh, time limitations, we're not able uh, to address all of them. But of course, I thank the participants for being active. Uh, I uh, managed to group uh, three questions uh, uh, for our, our speakers. And uh, one would be for, uh, for Mark Michelson, uh, uh, another uh, general question uh, 
will be addressed uh, to the uh, minister and the last one will be uh, to uh, to the ambassador. Uh, Marco, are you with us? Uh, okay, and then uh, uh, Marco will rejoin us. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, then uh, the minister. Uh, so the question for you is uh, the next one. Uh, what would Ukraine and government uh, advise for the West to take uh, uh, some steps to increase the cost borne for or by Russia and uh, deter future military or other destabilization operations? So what would we, what would you uh, suggest uh, for the West to take uh, whatever steps to deter Russia uh, for further military escalation? So destabilization operations. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, I actually, uh, I'll take this opportunity also, and I'll probably uh, speak some Ukrainian as well. Uh, and I'll uh, reflect back uh, on a, a number of issues which I wanted actually to, to raise uh, and I forgot to raise uh, during my uh, intervention. I would like to thank participants for participants are reported and the terminology that we use when it comes to Crimea. I pray that several of our speakers used it and annex Crimea, which is incorrect. I mean, term. And so this is what we're trying to avoid when the first time initiated the resolution, the General Assembly. Crimea is the temporarily occupied territory of Ukraine, and it's not annexed in any way because the racial resolution doesn't acknowledge its annexation. This is the direct quotation from the resolutions because occupation is a temporary status without transferring this sovereignty over the territory. And so if we see this annexed territory, it means we we we, uh, we acknowledge its uh, legitimacy. So, I, all, so based on Geneva Convention, uh, that, so this, these rights are not applicable uh, no, to this case. So if we speak, this is an next next territory. We should not require from Russian Federation uh, compliant with international humanitarian law in this territory. So, Yes. So it's true for, for conscription, relocation of the population, and which is which is prohibited by the Article 4 to uh, Geneva Convention, if I'm not mistaken. Secondly, well, I would like to say that uh, today, today's participants uh, talked about the ATR channel is very vital issue and I want to reassure the Ukraine in particular Ministry of Reintegration of Temporary Occupied will support ATR channel within the budget we it was allocated by the parliament and uh, will last to increase this budget and at the same time it's important ATR support will be supported within the framework of the law that provides for uh, for a uh, bidding process. I understand that you are not, that the channel is maybe disappointed by this fact, but what we're trying to communicate directly with the TV channel, with the image list, bringing now uh, the vision number. Then we hope that we heard each other. And we do hope that in the future, we'll have a very constructive cooperation because in addition to ETR channel, we we have a commitment to support other broadcasters that broadcast to temporal occupied territory. And, and we're forced to leave these temporal occupied territories, both in Crimea and in Donbass. This is another issue I would like to address. And third is the question, the one you have asked. 
Önemli. The answer will be very simple. Uh, and you heard it many, many times, the sanctions, regardless of the fact that many, many believe that sanctions are not efficient, it's absolutely wrong. Sanctions are, are quite, quite complex instrument in, in terms of their publication and getting tenure results. They, they don't give the short-term output, but in long-term they're very efficient and, uh, and strengthening, this, and I emphasize the strengthening of uh, sanctions because, because uh, they should be enhanced and strengthened. This will cause Russian Federation to change their policy towards not only Ukraine. I like to emphasize that Rush, Russia's war against Ukraine is not just is not a bilateral law. Russian Federation considers, in this case, Ukraine as just a, a tool in their global war with the West. So this is the war, the fact in the middle of Europe, and uh, we can we believe this obligation. Of the Russian, of the Western world is to support Ukraine and withstand Russian Federation. Because let us be frank: if Ukraine fall, the wall will will knock on your doors. As of today, Ukraine deters Russian Federation. We repel them. Therefore, the sanctions. Uh, I, should, I should say, which maybe it's not the responsibility of our uh, the ministry, but that Nord Stream is a classical example. The construction of this of this pipeline allows Russian Federation to to free the hands and to be to escalate the situation in Ukraine. So please. So we need to strengthen uh, the Prussian Russian and so, so the Russians have to pay the price. So I call to strengthening uh, actions. The next question, uh, which is uh, addressed to Marco, I see Marco rejoin us. Yes, uh, Marco, uh, the question is actually related uh, uh, to the sanctions uh, and uh, it was asked uh, by a participant how we in the West should assess the effectiveness of the Crimea-related sanctions, uh, I mean, American or European sanctions, or should we maintain the same level or should we increase them? Yeah, thank you, Dmitry. It's um, it's a very relevant question, and uh, we have to understand that it's much easier to to discuss the, the kind of sanctions if uh, this is only a matter of one country to to uh, uh, to make decision. Uh, but here we uh, we at least then we talk about uh, European Union. There is uh, 27 member states who uh, have to find uh, this common denominator. Uh, which allows us to uh, to uni unitedly uh, uh, support and back uh, sanctions. Uh, as I said during my intervention, this is somehow still a miracle. I must say, as uh, as uh, um, fo uh, I've been following uh, sort of the European Russia uh, discussion for many many years, and uh, this is what during seven years, during the last seven years, we have been able to actually uh, maintain current level of uh, sanctions is uh, is good sign, is good sign. But uh, at the same time, as uh, we recently um, witnessed uh, the development uh, within Russia in regard of Alexei Navalny or uh, some other uh, violations of human rights, uh, Within Russia, there is a still uh, uh, um, hesitation, of course, to uh, bring up uh, some uh, topics which uh, could uh, show the, the the kind of what could uh, strengthen 
uh, the regime of sanctions in general. It's not only about when we're talking about the Crimea. Uh, we also, um, as I said, must understand that uh, the, the Russian action has much wider implication, a much wide, wider sort of goal. Uh, and, uh, you know, if to only mention Nord Stream 2, uh, debates about in regard of uh, to, should we include uh, Nord Stream 2 as a topic into a sanctions uh, mechanism or not, uh, even during last uh, ministerial meeting of foreign Af ministers of foreign affairs of uh, EU. This uh, had quite, uh, let's say, quite interesting uh, debates, uh, but uh, again, um, uh, there were uh, found uh, uh, sort of common denominator. Unfortunately, sometimes it seems to public that this is very low. But again, we have to understand that uh, that uh, the sanctions and which are unitedly uh, actually posed uh, by many countries work uh, in in uh, much better in terms than. Uh, and then they are unitedly opposed. And uh, as we have seen recently from uh, remarks of uh, Russian foreign minister uh, in regard of uh, EU or relations between Russia and the EU, it seems that uh, uh, the united position and uh, common foreign security policy sort of agenda is something which really annoys Moscow. And we have to solidly keep this uh, the same level and if there is a possibility to try to increase and toughen uh, sanctions and th in this the last point we have to of course one is european uh, action from eu side another is of course very strong cooperation transatlantic cooperation with uh, the united states and canada <laughs> thank you thank you marco uh, thank you for your answer on that and the last question uh, will be to you ambassador and uh, as you actually started uh, this event with your greeting remarks, it's a good occasion uh, for you to say also the last words. Uh, but before uh, uh, the last words, uh, the question is about uh, the Ukrainian diaspora. So the question uh, is, what role should play Ukrainian diaspora in different countries, in particular in Estonia or other uh, friendly countries uh, in order to support and foster communication on uh, the occupation of Crimea. Do you have uh, some ideas or some means for involving uh, Ukrainian diaspora uh, into that uh, dialogue? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dmitry, for the question. And um, many thanks for all the speakers. Indeed, very interesting discussions, made many points, information, legal aspects uh, on the ground. It's, it's very important. Coming to the question, um, the diaspora in any country, I would say, but in particular in Ukraine, since we have huge Ukrainian diaspora in Estonia, in my view, is a very efficient instrument of public diplomacy. So the diaspora should play, and indeed it does play, the role of promoting um, positive image of Ukraine and promoting Ukraine abroad, its culture, history, and of course, in safeguarding Ukraine's national interests, in particular in terms of uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine in Donbass, in Crimea, against Ukraine in general, as Marco Mikkelsen pointed out directly. So my view is that diaspora, uh, in particular, in big in countries where you have huge diaspora, like in Estonia, we have quite a big diaspora. It's a very important instrument to promote Ukraine and to uh, safeguard Ukraine's interests in terms of uh, um, countering Russian aggression, Russian propaganda. And indeed, we have great cooperation, um, in particular, even with um, uh, Evgen Sibulenko in terms of legal aspects and uh, countering some disinformation aspects, uh, which we uh, reveal in Russian, uh, in Estonian media or Russian narratives where, where we find it. So it is also one aspect. So political aspect, pu public diplomacy and information aspects. So I, I, I surmise this is the three pillars where we can rely on Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I see actually... Me, can I hear just one small remark, uh, if possible? I just add to the chat uh, some links to the, uh, first of all, report of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, which I have mentioned 
plus a couple UN resolutions, uh, PASE resolution and preliminary report of ICC for your reference. It's very interesting document, so feel free to familiarize yourself with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all speakers. Uh, we uh, managed to uh, organize this event uh, uh, into hours, which is actually rather a long one for uh, Zoom conversations, but honestly, I enjoyed very much and those two hours went very quickly. Thanks to your uh, interesting stories and your insights and the ideas uh, you shared. Again, I uh, thank all the speakers and of course all the participants uh, for listening and watching us and also sending uh, your questions. I also thank uh, our media partners uh, in Ukraine, uh, also Krim Reali and uh, National News uh, Agency of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine Forum, for uh, supporting, uh, supporting uh, our media relations in regard to this event. Uh, uh, obviously, I also thank uh, the Ukrainian embassy uh, in Tallinn and personally the ambassador, Mariana duzhe okay. And uh, again, uh, uh, we will continue to uh, cooperation uh, in uh, regard of uh, Ukraine's uh, support and to develop its uh, national resilience. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.